thank you for the talk. So I have a question for you, Emmanuel. Uh, how do you deal with the delay uh, from the satellite uh, information? Do you make, um, when you take your measurement, do you uh, apply the delay on the measurement before your forecasting? Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you for your question. Yes, there is a delay. Uh, those 15 minutes uh, uh, usually take some minutes extra for the transmission of the image. However, uh, when dealing with the measurements, we made the, the average with the seven minutes before and the eight minutes after in order to make things synchronized, okay? Uh, so, we are waiting for the image to come from the satellite. Uh, we have uh, one picture, let's say, of the past. Uh, therefore, our training is uh, affected by this delay. So we are training the model with the past picture, let's say, in order to forecast uh, the next 50 minutes. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you, Elena, for this very nice presentation. Um, my name is Nicholas. I also work in spatial forecasting of PV uh, power. And I have a question concerning the uh, temporal res resolution of your data, which was 15 minutes. If you think uh, that it's enough for this kind of problem, or if you're more or less witnessing uh, sm temporal smoothing, or a spatial smoothing, that is, um, or if it's enough and if you've checked the, the average cloud speed uh, versus the distance between the systems. Um, thank you for this question. Um, to be honest, uh, I was the cloud speed is not so easily available. <laughs> So I could not be able to check uh, this. However, I think that for six hours ahead, 15 minute resolution uh, was enough and it was somehow our targeted um, resolution. And let's say it was also uh, due to the fact that we only had the data with 15 minute resolution and obtaining uh, at least real data that's not already synthesized and smoothened is a very big issue. So I would be happy to work even in, in the higher resolution if I would uh, have data. <laughs> I have a question for her. <laughs> uh, have you considered, uh, th first of all, very nice uh, work. Um, have you considered different typology, different classes of clouds? Because they're moving differently, some of the clouds are disappearing along the path. So if you are able to clustering, the, to, to perform some clustering on these, uh, okay, you, you have understood the question. Is it, is it, do you think it's effective? It's increasing the performance accuracy? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. I think um, it would certainly help. And I'm already stepping now in the second part of my work in the paper that has been submitted. Um, and there we didn't consider cloud different type of clouds when making prediction. But when analyzing uh, the interpretability of the model, we did but I think it would be certainly interesting to, un to have this information when making a prediction. Although um, we were very happy, I have to say, with uh, the accuracy we achieved with only PV data. <laughs> Thank you. We have actually time for other questions, so. So hi, um, thanks for sharing your research. And I have a question to all of you. Is your research already applied in the real world? And how is the performance there? <laughs> thank you. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, yes, uh, this re research that you have seen, uh, it's the reason why we have it probably on the real data set, because one of our clients uh, has used it, so it is applied in the real world. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, it is employed um, in the real world uh, and we, it's 
let's say, good enough the accuracy we have achieved for the purpose of uh, managing microgrids, of course. But we, we want to perform more accurate and maybe sof more sophisticated uh, solution, let's say. Thank you. Georges, you may want to answer uh, as well. Yeah, so we're working quite closely with uh, one of the transmission system operators in Germany, and in particular Transnet PV. And um, yeah, so I don't know if they are, are actually using these models, but uh, certainly they know, like we present the results, we, um, we, gi we gave them the models and yeah, apart from that, hopefully they are being deployed. <laughs> Um, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, two questions for Rielina about the autoencoder. Uh, so first of all, what is the motivation behind choosing such architecture? I mean, did you try other models that didn't work? And second question would be the architecture itself. Is it more of a classical compression, decompression kind of autoencoder or is it just a nonlinear transformation? Uh, thank you for your question. Well, the idea was um, first we wanted to actually map the signals that we have to the lower uh, space and then to use it to forecast the prediction. And in, in this work, we have tried also some uh, more simpler architectures and they did not perform so well. But uh, since this is... Um, it is we this is a sequence to sequence um, prediction task. So that's why we went in this direction with using encoder and the decoder because we first want to estimate the state of system and then based on this estimation we make prediction instead of having a maybe um, one simpler model that makes directly a prediction. I think uh, yeah the this model perform much better than some simpler models, of course. Yeah, I, I would have two more questions. Uh, one for Georges. Um, for the, you use this features the, the time of the year and the time of the day. And I was wondering if you, uh, because previous to your uh, presentation, we saw a clearness index uh, I was wondering whether you considered just correcting these diurnal and yearly cycles out of the power data with using a physical model and then predicting the the actual uh, irradiance or clearness index. Um, yeah, we could do that. Uh, well, just um, um, maybe I didn't make the scope of the of of our work um, so clear. Uh, so we wanted to see. Um, which are the most relevant features and um, how a forecasting model you know, handles this information in order to make a prediction, both in point forecast and also um, uh, the uncertainty. So definitely, yeah, um, we could do that as well. Um. Okay, and one more on the graph neural network. Uh, I was wondering if you had a criterion, criterion to choose the neighboring nodes for us single system if this was distance related or if this was a uh, tilt or azimuth of the system? Uh, thank you for your question. It's a very good question. Uh, I should have maybe said that in the presentation. Um, the How we choose the nodes, it was just the closest neighbor's graph. So we decided to use in the case of GCL STM 15 closest neighbors and in case of GC Trafo 24 uh, closest neighbors. And it's based on spatial proximity because we had information of longitude and latitude of each of these uh, PV stations. And then this is further used in training, so we find these correlations that I was trying to speak about. <laughs> I hope that was clear, but we can also discuss more or... Okay, question for Georges. Uh, regarding the Shapley value, uh, well, it's an interesting application of it, uh, but I'm wondering what is the practical, I mean, the value out of it. I mean, you, you see that there's a, the impact of some of the features on the final result, right? But does it mean that you remove some of the features and the results you get are more or less the same, or can you reduce the model, make it simpler? Well, it depends. Um, as mentioned, yeah, we, we can uh, interpret the model 
all individual predictions, we can also get some insight about the general uh, behavior of the model. Um, but yeah, the practical application is that, okay, we can identify which features contributed the most. Um, so the features that contributed the most, obviously they cannot be discarded uh, like this. Um, in this Have you tried discarding the other ones, the, the less important ones? Yeah, the, the, less, uh, the least important ones, yeah, we, we discarded three of them. And um, yeah, we achieved a better performance uh, after all, uh, which was surprising, um, to be honest, because we said, OK, we, we remove information from, from our training set. How can the model behave better in the end? So um, apparently, in the first case, uh, when we use more features, we increase the dimensionality of the problem. Um, and this may end up in a local optimal solution uh, in the optimization. Um, um, secondly, I think it's a, it's a more of a data-centric approach in machine learning where we actually need um, um, better data than more data to train the model, right? Um, and I think that was kind of of this um, of this application. Yeah, but okay, but how did you reduce the, the features then? I mean, what was the uh, it was a threshold that, that some of them didn't meet, and how did you select the threshold? Yeah, th th this is always important. Okay, yeah, so it was just uh, a user defined. Let's say it, it wasn't the threshold, um, a threshold, like a threshold, a specific threshold. It's, it was just by observing um, the sharp summary plots, and uh, we could see that there are only a few. Uh, training examples that actually use the information of temperature, precipitation, and wind speed. And also we, we saw that um, the uncertainty increased uh, for, for a couple um, of training examples when those features were deployed. Um, so it's rather, you know, a user-defined mm -hmm. threshold, so to say. Okay, thanks. Any uh, more questions? OK. Do you have one? Yes, actually, okay. just oh. rephrasing my second question uh, regarding the autoencoder. Because uh, so in like classical autoencoder would be the decoder being a mirrored version of the auto of the encoder. I don't think this is the case uh, in, your, in your model, right? Yes, it's uh, as you have seen in especially in GC Trafo, there are different blocks in the encoder, and the, well, the, at least one block in the decoder is different than in the encoder. And on top of that, we have MLP both in GCLSTM and GC Trafo uh, in the let's see decoder, or you can view it at as after the decoder. So, are we still talking about a compression decompression? Uh, is the input equal to the output? Uh, how does it work? The input is clearly um, the input is past PV data with clear sky radiance data, and the output is only uh, future PV data because this clear sky radiance it's not weather data; uh, it is deterministic variable that can be uh, calculated. Um, for any location on Earth, any time in the year, for any year in the past or the future. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Very nice talk all for all of you. But, uh, I have one question for Yelena. Uh, did you also consider what can be done if you have a change in data? So it's a very I would say it's a very tip because you you work with m probably multiple hundred PV stations and some of them uh, are not working at some time, others are added. So in with this whole graph process, or do you also consider like other input shapes, for example, kind of synthesizing an image instead of a graph because you also have the, the spatial property there or something in this direction? Okay, thank you for a question. This is a very interesting question. Um, the reason why we have only 300 PV stations in the data set, our data set was much larger, but of course the data is very imperfect. There are huge gaps. So these are, let's say, um, at stable 300 PV stations. And uh, for example, we, we did not uh, consider making an image and then trying to work on the, some mo applying models on the image because this is irregular grid. The PV stations are not um, spread spatially equally. And that is the reason why we actually use graph signal processing, why we use these graphs, because 
we can use them on irregular structure. And the model we have compared to, the STCNN, actually try to reorder the nodes, create image out of them, and then apply some convolution, uh, convolutional neural network, and you, you could see the, the accuracy of that model. Is, I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, and I very nice talk, Elena. A uh, question for you. Uh, since Switzerland had so many mountains, I think that's also the uh, uneven distribution reason for this solar power. Uh, first, did you consider also the elevation of the stations? And the other thing is, like I saw in Ticino, there are only a few solar power plants. Was it enough to also get a good prediction there? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, first uh, question was, yes, uh, the Switzerland has many mountains and then um, even cloud movement and everything, I, I think it's much more difficult th to mm -hmm. make a prediction when there is only a flat uh, land. And um, that's why we're very happy with, with this performance of our models. However, uh, it's uh, in Ticino. We have also observed um, node by node for certain areas that we made prediction. And for Ticino, the, the accuracy was really high, even though there are only few stations. Although I believe they have the most sunny days <laughs> in Switzerland. <laughs> That's one uh, part. But the second part is even with a few stations, the model is, the models, both of them, mm -hmm. were able uh, to use the neighborhood inf information in order to make a prediction. So I think this was maybe a very good, um, good example of why these models work. Okay, thank very you. good, thank you. So I really hate to do this, but this will be the last question. Um, I'd like to ask um, Professor Oligari. Um, the first question is, I see your uh, study just have 10 days of data. So um, um, is it enough to make sure that the model perform robustly for a different uh, type of weather, for example? Thank you for your question. Uh, of course, if we increase the number of uh, data, we are expecting uh, uh, better results. However, we kept this uh, because uh, we filtered out uh, a lot of data which were not reliable. Also, in the measurements, we considered only, for instance, uh, those uh, who were um, consistent with uh, the uh, azimuth angle and solar angles, uh, the, sorry, the elevation angle uh, greater than uh, five degrees. Uh, so uh, in order to reduce the uncertainties uh, in the sunrise and in the sun setting. Okay. So of course we are increasing, if we are increasing the number of uh, images and data, we are expecting a, a better result, hopefully. Um, maybe just one last quick question. Yes, for please. Also for you, um, I'm collecting some um, s score of different models and compare them. So do you have any advice like what I should um, particularly Can pay? you repeat, please? Sorry, I didn't get the question. I'm, I'm collecting uh, different scores of different models yeah. from different studies to compare which... Mm, type of model can be superior, for example. So uh, do you have any um, advice, like what I should it pay It really depends on the time horizon you want to forecast. Uh, yes. And uh, indeed, it depends on uh, several factors. As I have shown, naive persistence in the very short term forecast could be the solution, because also it's very simple. However, machine learning based uh, neural networks with multi mm, layer perceptron the simplest ones are indeed good but also it depends on how many data you have in order to train something so sometimes you can't afford data therefore you can't rely on uh, machine learning uh, models basically thank you you're welcome Um, Yelena and Georges, do you also want to answer the last question? Maybe you have something to add, as you wish. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit out in my thoughts. Uh, can you <laughs> can the okay. last question be repeated? <laughs> Perfect. Um, maybe, do you want to repeat the question? Uh, 
Um, um, so I just re repeat it quickly. So um, um, what I should uh, pay attention when I compare different uh, individual studies, the score of different models. Yeah. Yes, I think Professor already said that you should take care on the prediction horizon because as you have seen, um, I, I did the prediction for, uh, GC for graph, for graph based models. Uh, from one to six hours ahead, and also you need to take care of which data you have when making prediction, because if it's only PV data, it shows the highest accuracy, but as you start adding, for example, weather data and including, you see how from fifth, six hours ahead forecast, the models, even simpler one that used uh, weather data would be more effective for, I guess, from six hours ahead to one day ahead prediction uh, forecast.